gradually weave them together to the point where they become increasingly automatic and increasingly strategic before we get to skilled reading. So anybody tell, who tells you that reading is uh, natural and will just happen all by itself uh, <clears throat> is misinformed. <laughs> so, <clears throat> uh, Marcel Proust, have you ever heard of uh, Marcel Proust, who was a French author? What can you tell me about Proust? Anything particular? Proust is one of the wordiest writers in probably in the history of written language. He wrote volumes and volumes and volumes describing memories and, uh, and, and very complex thoughts that he had. Uh, he, he wrote in French, but there were like, he wrote a book about um, a remembrance of things past and there were just volumes of it. And I remember having to read some of it when I was um, a junior in high school taking French and so on, particularly about this little cookie that he dipped into a, that he had and took a bite of and he was flooded with all the memories and so on that came from just eating that cookie, which I thought at the time, um, why do I have to sit here and read about what Proust thought about his cookie? But over time, <laughs> over time, it makes more sense to me um, what the ability to read something like Proust or any complex writer is and understand it is what Marianne Wolf calls deep reading. In other words, we can read and we can understand and then we can take something from it and make it our own. So here's the, uh, the Proustian principle, if you will, is uh, uh, here, just a quote from him, we feel quite truly that our wisdom begins where that of the author ends. And we would like to have him give us answers, but we can receive the truth from nobody. And that we must create it ourselves that which is the end of their wisdom is the beginning of ours. What he's talking about there is what we want our, our students to be able to do, which is to read, absorb knowledge, and then take it and create knowledge of their own and use it to put for further uh, development of their intellect and their uh, and their skills. And I don't care if, uh, if my students read Proust. I wouldn't blame them if they didn't. But that's basically what we want. That fluency takes us to the point where we can do something like that. And that's, I think, the importance of fluency. So ultimately, we want to go beyond the author's ideas to our own thoughts. And uh, so that our thoughts are increasingly independent and of the written text and somewhat transformative. By reading, we actually develop our brain in a very unique way. And uh, so essentially, it's our best vehicle toward, uh, toward having a transformed mind and a changed brain because we have to create, we have to create a reading brain. Each one of us, each one of us has to, there's no genetic or, or uh, functional or structural place in the brain that is, uh, that is there for reading. We did not evolve to read. So we've, we need to create connections in the brain in order to have that happen. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about developing reading fluency. So, um, so just a little bit, I promise not a lot, a little bit of neuroscience. Um, but um, the, the, what happens when we, in order to read, there is nothing natural about it. 
But we all start with the brain. It's changeable. It has what's called plasticity. You've heard that term before. That basically means that we can, um, that based on our experience, we will create pathways, neuro, uh, pathways of neurons and circuits in the brain that will become more specialized as we grow and develop and so on. So uh, as a result, you know, those of us who have children want them to, uh, want them to get good at things so they, they may take piano lessons, they may play hockey, they may uh, do any, go into drama and so on, any number of things. And those activities will will create a very unique set of pathways and circuits in the brain that uh, will <coughs> enable whoever, who, you know, enable our children to be able to uh, specialize and get really expert at certain things. Um, but we have to, we have to support those new connections that are building. So the brain, what the brain does is uh, actually, we didn't, again, we don't have, we didn't evolve reading connections. However, we did evolve language ability, oral spoken language. And so what the brain does is that it reuses old circuits for language, recycles them, and enables us to then <clears throat> be able to deal with printed the printed word and printed language, which is, I don't know, I find that fascinating, really. But kind of scary because it means that, you know, um, the idea that every, every kid will learn to read in, in good time isn't really true. You know, it isn't, it isn't really true. And we have to do a better job of, uh, of supporting that kind of language development, the print, printed language. So, Basically what happens is the left hemisphere, left side of the brain has <clears throat> some basic areas that are wired for language. The, uh, the rear part on the left side of the brain, this is, uh, this is basically an, uh, the occipital, in the occipital lobe, this is the area the, what, that's called the word form area and that's where um, perception of letters and symbols and so on occurs. Um, and here the word analysis area, and this is wildly simplistic, but uh, this is basically where um, where uh, the conversion between sounds and symbols merges so that <coughs> here the occipital lobe will, will read C-A-T and recognize that. Up here in the word analysis area, that will convert to C-A-T. And then the circuit over, uh, moving over here to Broca's area will connect with the semantic meaning and there'll be, you know, associate that there's a cat. This all happens in milliseconds um, so that it's so fast. What we want to do is give lots of early language experiences, early reading and so on, to help develop the circuits, the fast circuits that go between these as efficiently as possible. Now in dyslexia, what happens is that um, we know this because we have brain scans. We have fMRIs so that you can put a child or an adult into a big MRI machine and have them read a book and then you can see what lights up in the brain and that tells you what the circuits are. And in, uh, in a non-dyslexic reader, the left side of the brain, all these areas light up and then a little bit on the right side. But in dyslexia, this, the rear part, these two rear parts basically don't respond 
when the uh, person sees printed words. Instead, the right side of the brain tries to, tries to recognize the word kind of holistically, and it does a really terrible job. So, we, the, so <clears throat> children who are dyslexic have this great difficulty learning to read because they're not, they're not recognizing letters and making the connection between the sounds. But what's great is that because the brain has plasticity, we can